Okay, Verochim Abayim Rabotai. We are uh, <coughs> here gathered to give a class. I was asked by um, a few people to shed light on a certain class that was given by an individual and uh, to basically go over it, to listen to it, and to see if there's any issues with the words that were said. So, uh, actually, it was not something that I was uh, excited about listening to after I listened to it. But uh, I think it is important to comment so there's clarity on this subject and what was discussed. Because I believe a lot of people have confusion about exactly what is and what isn't and what was said, what wasn't. And to the best of my ability, we try to figure out exactly what's consistent with our values and what may not be. This is not a, a political class. It's a class in learning to try to figure out the, the truth. So the first thing that stood out when listening to this class is a reminder of what the Rambam says in Morene Bukhim. Rambam writes that why is the Hebrew language called Lashon HaKodesh? Why is it called a holy language? After all, it's a language that communicates like every other language in the world. What makes a language holy? It's just a way of talking. So the Rambam writes that in the Hebrew language, there are no words that describe those parts of the human body that are supposed to be private. And there are no words that describe those human activities that also are supposed to remain private. So even if the Torah would describe such a act or describe such a part of the body, it would do it in a hint or in a reference or a euphemism. It would not say it outright. So therefore, if one would speak only Hebrew, only Lashon HaKodesh, he would have no way of uttering words that are not appropriate, certainly no curse words, and no things that are not considered Kadosh. Of course, we're not talking about modern Hebrew, we're talking about Lashon HaKodesh. The Gemara says, in Masechet Pesachim, Le'olam yesaper adam belashon nekiya. A person should always speak with a clean language. That means even when describing things that may not be so clean, but when he talks about it, figure out a way to make it clean. And the Gemara gives an example. The Torah talks about the Tum'ah of a Zav and a Zavah. A certain Tum'ah that can happen to a man or a woman. And there are laws about what happens when this person who is Tameh, either the man or the woman, is riding on an animal. What happens to what it's riding on? So when it comes to the man describing what the man does, so the Torah says, Merkav, meaning the, the man is riding on the animal. But when it comes to the woman, to describe the same act as riding, the Torah would not write that the woman is riding. Because that would be showing the woman in a way that's not appropriate, that she's riding with her legs. And therefore the Torah says, Moshav. When it comes to the woman, it says she was sitting. It doesn't say riding. Again, the Gemara learns from there, that when a person talks about certain issues, he should make sure his Lashon is Naki. In this uh, lecture that I heard, about an hour and a half, where constant usage of words that would not be appropriate, would not be considered Lashon Naki. Things that needed to be discussed, Beremez, with a hint, certainly not directly. In fact, the person speaking even apologized and said that he's going to use some explicit terms here. But jokingly he said, I hope everyone here is grown up. He says, we are in Britain and not in America because Americans can't handle any of this stuff because the Americans, as he said, are very sheepish, meaning they're very, they have shame. But I think he missed the point. It doesn't make a difference if you're talking to British or to Americans. The Torah is in Britain and America the same and in Israel. That a person must be watching the way he speaks to all people. Speaking with a shame is considered praiseworthy, not something to be embarrassed of. The Gemara says, 
Avon nivlut pe sarot rabot. This is not a small thing when a person uses his mouth to say things that are inappropriate. The Gemara says that because of it, there will be tremendous sarot, tremendous troubles to Am Yisrael. Wukzerot kashot mithadeshot. And new decrees because of it. It's no light matter that a person be careful with the way he uses his mouth. In fact, the Gemara brings a pasuk in the Navi, which I don't have time to go over now. A pasuk in Yeshaya, where it says that Hashem's anger will not go away. And the Gemara explains what is that referring to. And the Gemara says, Rav Hanim Barabrava says, he says, everyone knows why hakol yodaim kala lama nechnesa lahupa. Everybody knows why a bride goes to a hupa to get married. Everyone understands what's going to happen. He says, Ella, kol hamenabel piv. But someone who defiles his mouth, and brings forth those words from his mouth to describe what the Kala is going to do, says the Gemara, even if he had a decree of 70 years of good on his record, that it will turn the good decrees into bad. Why? Because he spoke the truth, he spoke the obvious, but it's not a subject that you discuss. You don't utter those words out of your mouth. Nivul peh is not something that we Jews are allowed to do. The Mesilat Yesharim says that Nivul Peh is not just forbidden because it arouses passion in a person. He says it's forbidden for itself. He calls it, it's like the equivalent of immorality of the mouth. There's immorality of actions and then there's immorality of the mouth. Nivul Peh, when someone speaks, Nivul Peh. In fact, there are some Rishonim that say it's an Isur from the Torah. The Pasuk says, Kadosh, your camp should be holy. Velo davar. Hashem should not see in your camp any type of immoral things. The Midrash says, what is that immoral thing? It says the Midrash, Ayrvad Dibur. That you should not use your mouth in an inappropriate way. So, like I said, the first thing that's noticeable before we even get into the content of what was said is that how a person speaks, especially a person who is respected and is a rabbi, needs to be extra careful that when the words come out of his mouth, they need to be pure. When coming to discuss the subject, I too will try to be clean with my mouth and not discuss explicit acts or relationships that are not to be described. But basically... He discusses two men having a relationship. And he brings a pasuk in the Torah that speaks clearly about this forbidden act, where the Torah says that a man may not lay with another man, the way he does with a woman. This is considered a to'iva, an abomination. And a person is hayav mita. It's a death penalty for such a Now, he brings from the Hiskuni, very respected commentary, and he says, why does the Torah say, Mishkeve Isha? Why does it say, don't lay with a man, Mishkeve Isha, like you do with a woman? He says, Mishkeve, only laying in the normal way of laying. But not other activities. Other physical activities are not included in the Pasuk. Which might lead one to think, that it's only the act itself that's forbidden from the Torah, but the actual, everything around it would be okay. So, the rabbi did not specifically say that. In fact, he did refer that maybe it's not okay. But just to be clear, it's important that we know what the rules are for us. Because it wasn't clearly stated what was not okay. As far as getting the death penalty, it's only the act. That's what the Pasuk is talking about. That's what the Hoskinu is saying. However, however, it's important to know that this is one of the Arayot that are mentioned in the Torah. The Torah has a parasha of Arayot discussing all the forbidden relationships like a mother, a sister, a nida. This is a forbidden relationship included in Arayot. This one, however, is unique in that not only are Jews forbidden, it's also forbidden for Goyim. Like the Rambam says in Ilchot Melachim, 
He says, Shesh arayot asurot al bnei Noah. Meaning, Am Yisrael has extra holiness. They have to stay away from more relationships than a goy. But a goy also has certain basic ones that he must stay away from. They are six. What are they? It says they are M. They are his mother. Eshet Ha'av. They are it's his it's his father's wife, even if it's not his mother. Eshet Ish, a married woman. Ahoto Me'imo. Vezachor and a male, ubehema and an animal. So that means these aray, this aray, this arayo, this arva of going with another man is not exclusive to Am Israel. It's something forbidden to all of humanity. All of the goyim are also forbidden. In fact, we know we have three cardinal sins that we are not allowed to do, even if we have to lose and give up our life. We know one of them is gilui arayot, immorality. This is included. A person who is asked to do such an act, otherwise they will be killed. The halakha says one must give up their life before they would do such an act. That's as far as the act is concerned. As far as everything around the act, the Rambam clearly says in mitzvah shin nun gimel, lo mitzvah 353, says the Rambam, Ve'am mitzvah, hi shehiz hiranu, Hashem commanded us, He warned us, mikiruv le'ahat mikol elu ha'arayot, that one is not only asur to do the act, but also to get close physically to any of the arayot. Ve'afilu belobia, even if it doesn't come to be at the act itself. Kegon, for example, he says, hibuk, whether it's hugging, neshika, or it's kissing, ve'adome lahem mife'ulot ha'zenut, any activity of zenut is also included in the forbidden isur of the Torah. Not in the one that you get mitah for, but it's forbidden nonetheless. It's a law ta'aseh. And he brings a proof. So again, this is equal for all the arayot. In fact, it could be that when men are together, it's even worse. It's another sin. Because the Rambam sin brings in Al-Khot Isurebiya, it's brought down Shohan Aruch as well, that nashim ha-mesulelot zo bezo. Women that are playing around with each other, asur, it's forbidden. Umi ma'ase mitzrayimu. This is considered an act of the Egyptians. Shehuzharnu alav. That Hashem commanded us about this. Shene'emar, like it says, ke ma'ase eretz mitzrayim lo ta'asu. Do not do the acts of the Egyptians. And, hachamim tells us, what is that? When a man is with a man, and a woman is with a woman. So therefore, clearly, whether it's the act itself or anything around the act, it's forbidden from the Torah. Again, I'm not accusing that rabbi of saying it wasn't, but it certainly wasn't clear. And one could walk away thinking that it's no big deal. It's just the act itself. It is a very big deal. It's an isur from the Torah. One of the things that was mentioned in the lecture is the definition of the word to'ivah. I don't really want to spend much time on it because I don't think it makes that much of a difference. So he says that people think it means abomination. And he said it in a very um, belittling way. That like, silly people, they explain the word abomination, which they are originally they explained as to the word, what the word means. He says, really, it doesn't mean abomination. He says, especially, he says it doesn't mean abomination to God. It doesn't say to Avat Hashem. It just says abomination. As if the Torah was written by someone other than God. It makes no difference if God calls it to'ava or to'avat Hashem. It's still a to'ava. And then he goes on to say that basically, the word to'ava doesn't mean abomination, something so terrible. He says, it just means that it's some, something that's not welcomed. Which sounds uh, very nice. I mean, it's not, it's not the best thing in the world. If I tell you not welcome to my house, so it's not so nice. But it's also, it doesn't mean you're a terrible person. You're not doing such a terrible thing. Just not welcome. Something to keep distant. And then he brings the Gemara and says, well, it's not even so bad. It just means that it's, a, it's variant from the normal way. It's a, the act is off kilter. Words like this are being used. The truth is, it, it's really irrelevant. I think it makes no difference what the word to'ayva means. One thing we know for sure 
is that when the Torah lists all the forbidden relationships, some of the worst ones, it just says, don't do it. Never says the word Torah. Until it gets to the end of the parasha. And then it talks about the Zachar. Says the Pasuk, Ve'ed Zachar, Lo tishkav mishkeve isha. Do not go with a man. To'evai. Now, that's not coming to say that it's any less. It's obviously coming to say that it's worse than the other ones. How worse? I don't know. The punishment is not worse. But obviously the Torah is stressing that this relationship is a little bit different than the ones I mentioned before. Perhaps, because maybe the act itself is considered despicable. Perhaps it's the act itself that it's not meaning if someone does something wrong against God, we understand it. It's a ta'ava that he falls into. But this one, the act itself is more than that. It's a ta'ava. And then the Torah says, by a behemah, also, tevel hu. Also describing it in not such a nice way. Now it's interesting. The end of that parasha says the word to'evot four times. It keeps repeating to'evot. Our rabbis in the Midrash understand that each one of those words, to'evot, is referring to these two. The mishkav zachar, man and man, and man and animal. It's not referring to all the other ones. Hachamim in the Midrash say, oh, just like when a man goes with a man is a to'eva, so we learn the other ones are also to'eva. But which one is the one that we're looking at, that we're learning from, that the Torah explicitly talks about? This is the, these relationships that we just mentioned. You know, the Hinuch, Sefer Hinuch, who gives us reasons for the mitzvot. When he comes to this mitzvah, 209, Reshtet, he explains why Hashem didn't allow us to go with another man. So he explains, first of all, it's hashhata. It's your, 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 your wasting seed, because it has no purpose. And then he says, milevad, besides, she'anyan oto tinuf nim'as umchuar hu me'od be'ane kol ba'al sechem. He says, this act is disgusting. He says, mechuar, it's ugly. Anyone who has a sechem, says the sefer ha'inuch, meaning it's an act that's obvious. That's something that, like we said before, toiva. It's something that's clearly not what God wants in this world. Like we said, it's one of the arayot. Like we said, even the goyim are asur. If anyone needs a proof that the word toiva is not a positive thing, so the pasuk says in Devarim, in Ha'azinu, yakniuhu bezarim, that they will anger God with false, with other gods. Beto'evot yachaisu. Ka'as. Hashem will get angry because of the to'evot that they do. Is that word again? To'eva. Says Rashi, what, what is that? Ma'asim te'uvim. Actions that aren't good, that aren't nice, that are to be distanced. Correct. It should be distanced. Kegon mishkav zakhur. Like mishkav zakhur. Like a man with a man. Ukhshafim. Also, Witchcraft. So again, when they want to bring out the anger of Hashem, they mention <coughs> the word to'eva. The rabbi goes on to say something very hard to believe. He says that the entire revolution today, that we have a revolution of such people that are becoming more popular, he calls that a revolution. First of all, the fact that you call it a revolution in itself is hard to believe. That usually describes very positive events. The entire revolution of these people in our society is a fantastic development for humanity. It's fantastic. He says, it's good for society. And he says that if we don't look at it that way, then then we're prejudiced. But if we're willing to put the prejudice on the side and see it for what it is, it's fantastic. 
he goes on to say that the world is moving in the right direction as a result. And he says that God is taking his world world towards love. These are the messengers of God, I guess, that are taking the word world to love because they love each other. And he says, he says Hashem doesn't wait for anybody. And since society is moving forward, and the world is moving towards love that God wants. If you're not on the bandwagon, so fine. He said you could stay back. But that's where it's going. I, I don't want to really go into his words too much to try to explain that. Because they don't sound very, very good. But to call for any Jew, for any human in fact, to call this a revolution that is fantastic for humanity, is something impossible to believe that it could be heard. That if I didn't hear it with my own ears, I would say, it's not possible. That's not what they should do. How could something that's hayav mita, the death penalty, that's forbidden to all humanity, not only Jews, to goyim as well, that one must give up his life for. And not only that, our rabbis tell us, Dor hamabul. What was the end of the Dora Mabul, the generation of the flood that Hashem destroyed the entire world? So says the Midrash, when they started writing Ketubah for a Zachar, they actually got married. And to a Behemah. Interesting. This was the reason why Hashem brought the Mabul on the entire world. He destroyed the entire world. God never destroys the world. Hashem has a tremendous amount of Rahmanut, of compassion. Even when Am Israel sins, even when the Goyim sin, Hashem is patient. But at that point, when they started to start writing, getting married, then the destruction of the world came. That's what the Pasuk is referring to when it says, The world started to become destroyed. It says, Hashem saw this. Ki hishit kol basar et darko al haaretz. It says that even the animals used to go with their own kind. That's how corrupt humanity became. That they went with each other and the animals followed suit. Ki shahid et darko. When that happened, the flood came. In the middle of his lecture, and this has nothing to do really with the subject, but he does something which is an absolute no-no when it comes to Judaism. He talks about the halakha that hachamim say that a man is not suspected of going with another man. Two Jews are not suspected to go with each other. And therefore they are allowed to be together in the same room. Lo nechshedu Yisrael al mishkav zachur. Unlike a man and a woman who are not supposed to be together, they can't be alone, because we suspect that something wrong may happen. But Hachamim decided that two Jewish men don't have this issue, and therefore they're not hashud. Good. So after quoting what Hachamim tells us, he says that he thinks that Hachamim were wrong. He says, because we should worry about Men being together. It is a problem. It is an attraction. So therefore the hachamim are wrong and therefore we should worry about it. Now if he meant to say that times have changed and maybe today we should worry about it, definitely there's room to say such a thing. Maybe during hachamim's time there wasn't what to worry about. But now it became a generation that's parutz, people running around doing crazy things. Today we have to worry about it. You wouldn't say, Hachamim are wrong. You say, today maybe we should be more strict. 
Then the hachamim were lenient. You don't say hachamim were wrong. That's not the way a rabbi or a Jew talks. We respect our hachamim to the utmost. Especially in this case. If you would have opened Shohan Aruch, you would see. In fact, Shohan Aruch brings his halakha. Shohan Aruch says, Lo nechshedu Yisrael al mishkav zakhur. Am Yisrael is not suspected that they will do such a thing. That's why lefichach. And Isur, therefore there's no Isur. You could be with a man alone in the room. He says, Ve'im nitrahek. But if a person wants to be extra strict, and you want to go far away, not to be alone with a man in the same room? He says, you're doing a beautiful thing. Great. And then, says Shulchan Aruch himself, And in our generations, now he's talking 500 years ago, in Tzfat. I don't know exactly what was going on in Tzfat at that time. He says, but he says, in our generations, people are doing immoral things. Yes, Even Shohan Aruch, with his greatness, the holy Maran Shohan Aruch, he wouldn't say, Hachamim are wrong. He don't say that. Oh, today we have, the situation got a little bit worse, so it's proper today, that's the right way to talk. That's a side point. Nothing to do with the subject, but one that needs to be pointed out. In the class, and this is in no particular order by the way, I'm just running through it, he says that most relationships had nothing to do with love. Most marriages had nothing to do with love until the Romantic period. I don't know when the Romantic period was. He speaks about it as if it's a known thing to all. I, maybe it is. I'm not aware of it. I'm assuming it's sometime recently. But he says that people didn't used to get married because they loved each other. Not for love. They got married for status. They got married to have children, but not for love. He says, if you're, you're lucky, if you're in the front side, the front tide of the romantic development, so now you're getting married for love, but uh, you'll be ahead of your time. But otherwise, if you were living before, people didn't get married for love. That's interesting. Not sure how he knows this. But what is extremely disturbing is that he goes on to ridicule his own grandmother. And he says in a mocking way and describing how his grandmother got married in Halab. And he said things like, oh, over there, they bring his grandmother a menu and they tell her, okay, you get to choose in a not in a nice way. He didn't say it in a nice way. You want to marry Ezra? Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Okay, Mabruk, yalla. Let's make a Bazra. Meanwhile, he says her life is over. He says he asked his own grandmother. And he asked her, did you love grandpa when you married him? And she said, no. But I love him very much now. She said, okay. He says, now you spent your life with him. You had children with him. Okay, now you love him. Hazaku Baruch, he says. That was the way he ended with his grandmother. Hazaku Baruch, now you love your husband. Hazaku Baruch. Because you spend so much time with him, you love him now. They had a good marriage, but it wasn't love. With this, he has forgotten one of the more, most important principles that we have when it comes to marriage, that love comes after marriage. Maybe he forgot that Yitzhak Avinu never met his wife Rivka. Should we mock also Abraham Avinu for not knowing how to teach his son how to love another woman before he gets married? He did it wrong as well. The Pasuk says in the Torah, that Yitzhak brought Rivka into his mother's tent. And then, He married her. And then he loved her. Because love comes after marriage. True love comes when you give someone, when you build with someone. 
What you have before marriage in today's time is called lust. It's an infatuation based on physical desires. In Judaism, we don't go out with women in order to love them. We go out with them to see who deserves our love. Whose quality deserves our love. Yes, and sometimes, even if we don't see them that much, if we know their quality and they come from a quality family, that's something to invest in. That is the way our grandparents got married. And our great-grandparents got married. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. And certainly nothing to be made fun of. We have not now gotten in the front because we're in the romantic period where people fall in romance first and they love each other and then they get married. We see how wonderful marriage is doing today in the world. How long people are staying married in that system. It's a shame that one would look at the way our grandmothers got married and look down at it. He says during his lecture that men have not been able to love each other. I don't know what this means. I don't know what the source is. He's not talking about any act. He's just talking about love. He says, till today, men have not been able to love each other. He says, he means to say that if someone loves another guy, so that means he is probably sleeping with a guy. So that's why we can't love each other because we're held back. Everyone thinks, he's going to think that we're, we have a relationship with him. He says, and I quote, It is the reason why everybody thinks that David and Yonatan were from those kind. Because they couldn't imagine that two men could love each other so much without being together. So that's why everyone thinks that David and Yonatan were such people. When I heard this, I thought, and I studied Tanakh a lot. I've studied that story many times. And I've studied commentaries on it. I never saw a commentary that said such a thing. He says, everybody thinks. I looked through every mefaresh that I could find. I searched every midrash that there is on the subject. I could not find one. I would love to see if there's even one. But even if there is one, it's certainly not everybody. Who exactly is he quoting when he says, that's why everybody thinks that they were like that? Who's everybody? Perhaps he means the people today who are walking around the streets and take the Bible and read it? Perhaps there are people like that. I can imagine that. But is that who we quote? That's who our Mefarshim on Tanakha? The people who learn like this? There isn't one commentary that learned this way. Why is he quoting it? And why is it everybody? Again, to the listener who doesn't know much, he says, wow, everybody to me means Rashi, Radak, Malbim, Gaon, all the Mefarshim on Tanakh, that's everybody. Who's everybody? That's what I would think. But Baruch Hashem, I have a little knowledge of Tanakh. I want to search a little bit. I couldn't find one. In fact, when our rabbis come to explain what true, pure love, what is pure love, our rabbis say. Our rabbis tell us, there's ahava, that's teluya badavar. There's love, that depends on something. It could depend on money. It could depend on physical desires. That kind of love, once the dabar goes, once the money goes, or the desire is no longer relevant, the, ba- the love is gone. But then there's a love that's pure. There's a love that's not based on anything. On not a desire, not on money. It's pure love. It says in Perkei Avot, Ezohi Ahava She'ena Teluya Badavar. Is there any love that we can describe that's not dependent on anything? Zero, nothing. Zo Ahava David Veyonatan. 
That's the love of David and Yonatan. Nothing. They loved each other because they loved each other. For no reason. He continues to explain, based on his theory, that men were not allowed to love each other, which again, I don't know where that came from. I never heard it before. And he basically says that Baruch Hashem, because of this new movement, like we said, the revolution, now people are starting to learn how to love each other. He says that uh, children have been missing out all these years. They've been starved for love. He says, many of our fathers, he says, couldn't bring themselves to show their children love. They couldn't say, I love you. They couldn't kiss their children. They couldn't hug their boys. It's a tragedy, he says. But Baruch Hashem, now the revolution came. And the revolution is now teaching the world that yes, Father, hug your children. Love them. Kiss them. It's okay. I must be missing something. I don't understand, first of all, what's the connection. The issue we have with such people is not the love that they have. It's the way they act with each other. I'm not sure if he forgot the commandment As Rabbi Akiva says It's the most fundamental principle of Judaism to love another person. It's a commandment in the Torah. It's not even an option. Certainly we have to always get better in that area. And throughout our history we pride ourselves for Ahavat Yisrael. There's no nation like our nation that goes out to help others, whether it's Hatzalah, waking up in the middle of the night to help a stranger, whether it's Shomrim for someone who had a tire that blew on the highway. The other day someone told me a guy came in the middle of the night and spent three hours with him to try to get his car out. You're talking about rabbis or teachers who spend their lives teaching young men and young ladies for a nominal fee. They can hardly live on what they get paid. This is called Ahavat Yisrael. Helping another Jew in any way, whether it's financial. Who gives more charity than Am Yisrael? That's Ahavat Yisrael. Who cares about their children and is willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in tuition that their children should have the best education. Which nation loves their children that is sacrificing every ounce of energy they have for them? That's Ahavat Yisrael. We see Ahavat Yisrael in all Jews. We see it in soldiers fighting for Am Yisrael. We see it in rabbis teaching. We see it in doctors. We see it in all kinds of people. Great people, small people. Gedolim in our nation. Great people in our nation are not necessarily the most learned. But they're the greatest. Ohev Yisrael. They're the ones who care and cry for every single person that needs the help. That's what makes a Gadol, a great man in Am Yisrael. We need the new revolution to teach us how to love another person. My father didn't love me. My father never told me, I love you. Never in his life. My father never hugged me once. But not for a minute did I ever doubt how much my father loved me. He's making a very big mistake to think that love has to be expressed physically to be called love. It's just the opposite. Today, maybe we have to hug our children and we have to kiss them more. Because maybe today we don't sacrifice and we don't give of ourselves to our children like the old generation. In the old generation, it was needless. It was not needed to say, I love you. Because it's so evident. A father and mother did so much for their child. 
It was not needed to say, I love you. What are you saying? Something so obvious. Maybe today, because we have so much of our own life and we do our own thing, we have to remind our children, by the way, I love you. We need to be taught love from these people. The world is going ahead because of this. How? What's the comparison? That's not the issue. Love is not the issue. The issue is acts that are not compatible with the Creator of the world. They're not teaching us love. Love we already have from the Torah Kedusha. And so, so many of our own parents and grandparents, every one of our parents and grandparents is a demonstration of Ve'afta l're'acha kamocha. That's how we know where love is. And the further we go away from our grandparents, the further we are from real love, not the opposite. He says, this is all in the same lecture, by the way. He says, in his words, he's attempting to make light of such a sin. He agrees that it's a sin. That much he's not going to go. He feels bad about it. But it's a sin. But he tries to lighten it a little bit. So along his derech of making it light, he says, well, everybody sins. Including long-bearded rabbis. From people, I'm not sure if the people he's talking to know what the word from means. It means religious people. Do not spend time with their wives the way the Torah obligates. There's a mitzvah of onah. So, they're sinning. He says, stop with the nonsense. Meaning, what's the, what are you guys going crazy? What are we going crazy when we see such people? Stop with the nonsense, he says. He says, no matter how long your beard is, and how long your coat is, everyone is sinning. They just have their own sins. That's all. Wow. What do you think, he says? Religious people do not assassinate character and embarrass people publicly and judge people unfavorably all the time. And they destroy people's businesses and careers. You don't think they do that? So not having a beard, I felt pretty good about myself. That he wasn't talking about me. Before we talk about what he said, specifically, but the lack of respect here that is shown to rabbis and observant Jews is absolutely shocking and is a tremendous Hilul Hashem, desecration of God. Especially when you're speaking in front of ignorant Jews, many of them, who are not fully observant. That's what, that's what it sounded like. While it's true that outer appearance doesn't guarantee that the person is acting in line with his looks, just because a person has a beard doesn't mean he's a righteous person. That's true. But we are commanded in the Torah to judge others favorably. And we are commanded to give people the benefit of the doubt. Especially if their outer appearance shows that they're interested in doing the right thing. We have no right to assume that everybody is sinning. And even if we find some people who look observant and we find them sinning and desecrating God's name, it is our job as Jews and especially as rabbis to remind ourselves and others that one individual doesn't represent the entire community. And it's wrong to judge the entire Klal Yisrael 
because of an individual's avera. We find this type of behavior with people who hate a certain group. When one hates a certain group, he looks to find an individual in that group behaving inappropriately and then they use his behavior to characterize the entire group and give himself and others reason to hate. This is an old strategy. It's not something new. We Jews are all too familiar with such strategy that's used against us all the time. How often are we judged as a nation because of one person who's acting rowdy in a hotel room? Or a person who's not acting properly in an airplane? And everybody is included in the mind of the person who's watching. If that's a Jew, then all Jews are doing bad things. All Jews are stealing because one rabbi stole. And all Jews are doing this because one person did it. And every time that happens to us, we say, it's not fair. How could they judge our entire nation on an individual? That's not the way to look at people. That one of our own people, he takes the stance that all religious people are sinning. How does he know? Who told him? Did he see them sinning? Did he go and see every single Jew in the world? Did he go visit Rav Chaim Kanievsky? Did he see him sinning? Did he see Chalavadja sinning? Did he see the great people in Yeshivot sinning? Did he see the simple grandmother sinning? Did he see, who, who, who did he see sinning? How does he know all this? That people make mistakes? We know that. We know people make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But guess what? The Gemara says if you see someone, he sins, you have to assume he made Teshuvah. Of course we make mistakes. But we get up. Sheva Yipol Tzaddik Vakam. A righteous person. Yes, he may fall down. He may fall down seven times. He may fall down 15 times. But he gets up. It is our obligation. It is our duty. Now when we see someone, A, not to believe he sins. There's no reason for us. There's no reason to look around and she'll say, no, everyone sins. Why should you say that? And even if we see someone sinning, maybe we didn't see it right. And even if we saw it 100% right, we should assume, well, probably you made a mistake. I'm sure when he got home, he felt bad. And he's sure he's thinking about why he did that. And he wants to make the truth. That's our obligation. It's a tremendous halu Hashem. And an apology is really needed for every Jew in the world. For every one of us. Again, I'm not saying we're perfect. But there's no reason for us to look around and assume that everyone is doing Averot. And by the way, and from the Hinuch aspect, from the educational aspect, how do you expect a crowd of people who may not be so observant, how do we expect them to want to raise the bar and become closer to the Torah and to its observance and to become close to Hashem. If we knocked out all the religious people in the world and said they're all liars and cheaters and they all do terrible things, so where should they turn exactly to have a role model that they should want to be like and should try to emulate? How would we educate a generation when we tell them that nobody, even the great people in their generation are doing terrible things? I'm sure anyone in that crowd who wasn't so observant was very, very happy to hear that there are Jews in the world, especially the religious ones, that aren't as good just like him. And I'm sure he went home that night feeling very good about himself. No longer having a desire to want to do any more than he's doing. Because he's just as good as all the other ones. A tremendous Hilul Hashem. Again, nothing to do with the subject. But it's hard to believe that someone could utter such words. He says, now about why he's saying this. Why is he getting into this whole beards and coats? Well, what is wrong with that? Because he wants us to stop with the nonsense. 
He says, stop with the nonsense. Why do we treat people like this differently than others? He says, we tolerate loads of prohibitions. Worse than this. There isn't loads much worse than this. These are the three cardinal sins. And it applies, and it's called Toiva. Why? He says, the reason why we don't tolerate this is because of societal reasons. That's it. He says, Lashon Hara is worse. When a person speaks Lashon Hara, the Gemara says, he has no Halek Olam Abba. He says, but these people do. So Lashon Hara, if you're going to go and say this guy is doing the wrong thing, so, so Lashon Hara also, who, who's not guilty of Lashon Hara? He says, you cannot get a minyan in a synagogue. If you're going to go scrutinize everybody's actions, you cannot find the hazan. He says, everybody has something in his closet that he needs to hide. He says, even the three cardinal sins, he says, most of us are hayav mita. Wow. He says, "En bayit she'en shamet." So there's no house that has no skeleton in his closet that he's trying to hide. So he says, "So let's not sit on the high horse." That means if I say that this relationship is asur and we should keep away from it, or I give ramifications to the actions of such people. So I'm sitting on the high horse. I'm saying, I'm better than you. And because I can't sit on a high horse, and we're all equal, so I shouldn't say anything. Everyone is doing the same thing, he says. He says, should we talk about immorality? He says, should we talk about the immorality that is running rampant on a daily basis for every person in Jewish society? One more time. These are the words he says. Should we talk about the immorality that is running rampant on a daily basis for every person in Jewish society? What? Again, what is he talking about? How does he know this? Who gave him these records? And to talk about it with such confidence. Everyone is so holier than thou, he says. This reminds us of Amalek. When the Jewish people left Egypt, all excited all ready to be close to Hashem. They saw all the miracles. They found purpose in life and are ready to raise themselves. The Pasuk says, Asher karecha baderech. As she says in one explanation, what does karecha mean? As she says that song, kar, kar means cold. He cooled you off. Don't get so excited. Don't get so excited that there are people doing terrible Averot. Everybody is doing Averot. Everyone is doing immorality. Everybody is doing bad things. Don't get so excited. It's okay. He talks about choosing a Hazan. He says, if we're going to look, do you know what the Halakha imposes? About the qualifications that have to be met in order to be a Hazan? Nobody would be a Hazan. So, I think if the question is, can a person who has such a relationship be a hazan? You should look up in Shohan Aruch. Study the poskim. If you can't find an answer, go ask the Gedolim. It's a very nice question. I don't know the answer to that question. Can a person who goes around with men and does it in the open, can he be a hazan? I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. It's a nice question. But he says... They wouldn't be a hazan today if I didn't send him up. You couldn't send up anyone to the Torah if I don't send him up. 
Really? Open Shahan Aruch. Shahan Aruch gives clear halachot. Who you can send up as a hazan and who you can't. Shahan Aruch says, and I quote here Yalkut Yosef because he brings it halachal ma'ase more for our period. He says, Shaliyah Tibur, to be a hazan, Sarih Shiyehe Hagun. You have to be proper. Ve'ezehu Hagun, who is proper, Shiyehe Betor Rekan Me'averot. That his house should be empty of sins. Like that he doesn't steal, doesn't hurt people. Obviously, if we took this person's understanding, we, there's nothing to talk about. We have, we have no hazanim to them. Because everybody, nobody has no averot. He has to be a person that people don't talk bad about him. He should be humble. People should be happy with him. He should have a nice voice. These are all qualifications. He lets things slide. He's not so stubborn. He's not flattering everybody. Doesn't have to be a very big scholar, but he has to know Tanakh. These are qualifications. Says Shohan Aruch, Im en motzim, mishi yebo kolim da'elu. If you can't find someone who has all these midot, yif haru hatov shabbat zibur. Find the best one. Be practical. Good. Shia'osek, but Torah, ma'asim tovim. And what if a person had a history, he had skeletons in the closet? Perhaps there are people who have skeletons in the closet. Maybe many of us. So what happens now? So Shohan Aruch says, that if a person is a Baal Teshuvah, if a person made Teshuvah, Af Shebayalduto Yatsa Alav Shemra, even though people spoke terrible about him when he was young, he says he was Mehalel Shabbat, he's the worst. He says he can now be a Hazan, Mutar, you're alive, because he made Teshuvah. Okay, good. The skeletons are out of the closet, no issue. No we make mistakes, we make Teshuvah. This rules. Why do we have to include all the people? and bring them in the garbage with them to show that there's nothing wrong with it. There is rules how to be a hazan. Open shuhan aruch. And if he's not allowed to be a hazan, then we shouldn't send to be a hazan. And if we're sending people that are hazan in the wrong place, they shouldn't be. We shouldn't. Let's talk about that. And if these people are fit to be a hazan, it's a very good question. It's a question that needs to be discussed on its own. It has nothing to do with the people with beards and coats and all the Jews sinning. Why does that have to be brought into the question? He says you wouldn't have a minyan if we started to tell these people that they can't be part of a minyan. You couldn't step to the Torah. That's not true. That is not true. There are rules of who can count for a minyan and who can't. Shohan Ruch talks about it. I'm not going to go now into the rules. And Apikoros, for example, person who denies the written or the oral Torah. He cannot be counted a minyan. So if there's a place they count them as a minyan, they're doing the wrong thing. What, what should we do? There are rules. Who to count as a minyan? One who has a ban, he's in harem, can't be part of a minyan. person who goes, serves idols, can't be part of a minyan. A Mishnah Rab brings, if a person sins out of spite, meaning not because of his desire, because he says, nothing wrong, I'm going to sin. Can't be counted as a minyan. If a person sins out of desire, you could count him for a minyan. He sins, but out of desire. He's not doing it because he, in spite, not doing it to anger God. He just can't control himself. That guy could be counted for a minyan. A mehalel Shabbat b'farhesia. Yakut Yosef b'feru says, Misha mehalel Shabbat Someone who is mehalel Shabbat in the open, publicly, He's, that does a melacha in front of ten Jews, included, he says, someone who drives on Shabbat, he says, is not supposed to count as a minyan. He's not one of the ten. He says, in extenuating circumstances, some are lenient. But he says, if one of those people is saying Kaddish, make sure someone else says Kaddish, because they really don't count. Again, I don't know what the rules are for these people. I don't know if they're considered machais, they're doing it against God. I don't know if it's called they're doing it out of desire. I don't know. But that's a fair question in halakha. Look up Shulchan Aruch. You don't see it there? Send the question in to one of the great rabbis to see what the halakha is. To say 
that everybody's sinning and therefore nobody could be part of a minyan and nobody's praying with a minyan and the shul will be empty and therefore it's no problem. What, what happens? So we just dissolve the entire Torah. What do we do? So we should stop learning. What, what are we learning for? Because no one follows the rules anyway and we don't do anything the right way anyway. That's the way how to give halakha to people. By bringing everyone on the side and saying they're wrong and assuming that and saying anyway and we invite them. By the way, if they're doing wrong, so maybe we shouldn't invite them. Why, who says you should invite them? And if you're inviting them, so that means maybe they're okay. So, learn the halakha. It's a halachic issue. Open shulchan aruch. It's unfair and totally improper to do what he did. It's a tremendous, tremendous halul Hashem. He brings how prophets, the Nevi'im, they rebuked people mostly about relationships. Because they didn't love each other. Which is true. Throughout the Navi we find. But then he makes kind of a belittling comment. Like, did they ever come and say, Hey, you guys, I'm putting on tefillin. We don't see that. We don't see that in the prophets. Did they ever say, Oh, shadnez, you not do shadnez. So we don't see that in the prophets. Shabbat, he says, rarely sometimes. But fight for the orphan. Fight for the widow. What, what, what exactly was the point of that? First of all, maybe they were putting on tefillin. That's why he didn't say anything about tefillin. Well, he, he knows that they weren't putting on tefillin and the Navi ignored it. The proof is they didn't keep Shabbat. He told them. And if they weren't keeping Shatnes, so maybe... He would have told them. Maybe they kept shatnes. Not one of the hardness for to keep. It's not a big desire to wear shatnes. So what, what is he trying to say that it's more important in the Torah to keep mitzvot between men and men than men and God? And as if God doesn't care about the mitzvot between men and God? Is that the message? He didn't say that. But is that what he's trying to say? In other words, these people are doing a sin between man and God. But you guys, you're doing a worse sin. Because you're sinning between man and man. Because look what the prophets scream about. The prophets screamed about man and man, not man and God. Is that the message? Maybe I misunderstood it. But let me add a little. Well, let me just tell him something. I can assure you that when the prophets spoke, they spoke to the person who was doing wrong to help him become better. They didn't speak to someone who's doing wrong about how somebody else is doing wrong and therefore what they're doing is not so bad. That I can assure you. The prophet spoke to you because you're doing wrong. So therefore help yourself. Could you imagine the prophet comes to you and says, you know, the other guy over down the street, they're doing very bad things. Yeah, you're not so bad. You're not so bad. The, the, the guys down the street, they're very bad guys. The prophet didn't talk about them. The prophet spoke to you, about you. You're going to bring the prophet as a proof to this? When you're talking to people who may not be doing the right thing and you tell them how the other guy is bad, how he needs to fix himself. So is that the message? That's how the prophet speak. Instead of helping people because of what they're doing wrong. Again, granted, we're not all righteous. And granted, we have to fix ourselves. And granted, we have to help these people too. They're Jews, we have to help them. No question. But there's a way to help people. To get better. Not to make them feel, actually, themselves better than others. And losing any kind of guilt that they may have had. In his words, when he tries to give a picture that society has always had such relationships it was rampant all the time which it could be I don't know he quotes a lot of books from the Goyim that seem to say it was but then he goes and slightly figures out a way to say that even by the Jewish people it was always rampant where did he see such a thing. So there's a pasuk 
זה פסוק אל מלכים. הפסוק says, ויעש יהודה הרע בעיני אדוני. יהודה, שבט יהודה, was doing bad in the eyes of God. They built במות, they built altars, they did things that they weren't supposed to do. וגם קדש היה בארץ. There was also a קדש בארץ. קדש is the Torah described as a male prostitute. וגם קדש היה בארץ. Also a קדש was in the land. עשו ככל התערבות הגויים. They did like the גויים abominations. אשר הוריש אדוני מפני בני ישראל. The same גויים that Hashem threw them out because of this, they are doing the same thing. His translation is that even though the Torah says you're not allowed to have male prostitutes, but it didn't work. This was his words. But it didn't work. And the Torah told us 3,300 years ago not to have a Kadesh, but it didn't work. It didn't work to me, it sounds like. Till today we've ignored this. He says, because we had them and they were all over Israel. At certain times. Like it says in Melachim. There were plenty of male prostitutes over Israel. So it was all over the place. It was completely normal. One second. Again. I look at the Pasuk. Who is he quoting? The Pasuk says, Vegam Kadesh. This day was a problem. There was a Kadesh. How many Kadesh? Maybe one. Maybe two. Maybe a minyan. I don't know how many. After all, For Hilul Shabbat in the desert, only one guy came out. And they made a big deal out of it. When Jewish people sin, even if it's one, it's a big deal. So, Gam Kadesh Haya Ba'aretz. How many were there? I don't know. But to draw a picture, unnecessarily, about our people, that it was rampant. If you would listen to him, you would sound, it would seem like the whole place was running around male prostitutes. Besides, the Malbim on the Pasuk doesn't even explain that way. He says, Kadesh is not talking about Jews. He says, they were Goyim Kadesh walking around and the Jews didn't protest. The Gam Kadesh, Haya Bahem, he says. Haya Ba'aret, Haya Ba'aret. Not the Jewish ones. But even if we don't take his explanation, it's not appropriate to depict a picture based on trying to sell something, especially when it puts down the history of our nation. He says, in his words, that God gave us principles, but not detailed law. Again, this is totally on the side that he said it. I don't know why he said it. But you can't say that. That's apikor sut. God gave us principles, but not detailed law. Open up the Rambam, right in the beginning. Hagdama. כל המצוות שניתנו לא למשה בסיני בפירושה ניתנו. All the mitzvot that the Jewish people got through Moshe Rabbeinu, they got the mitzvot and they got their explanations, their details. שנאמר, like the Pasuk says, and he brings the source, it's called Torah שבכתב, the written Torah, Torah שבעל פה, that gives us all the details. The Torah, Hashem only gave us principles, not the details. Again, I don't even know what he was trying to get with that. But that's wrong. You can't say that. The last thing I'm going to discuss, and this will end. He brings a Rambam in Moreh Nebuchim, the guy to the perplexed. And the Rambam says, I don't know if I fully myself understand the Rambam, I'll be honest with you. I believe I know what he's not saying. But Rambam basically says that sometimes the Torah doesn't fit everybody's situation. The Torah spoke to the majority. And sometimes there are individuals, the minority, that don't fit exactly with the Torah's commandment. He says, don't be surprised, this could happen. 
where an individual may not be able to see shlemut in the Torah. He says, but of course, he says that a person has to keep the Torah nonetheless. But it may not work for him. It may not be something that he connects to. I'm not sure exactly what he means, but that's, that's, those are the words that he says. So, it was said in the lecture that based on this Rambam, the nature of Torah is not tailored for everyone. Some of the mitzvot will rub you the wrong way. The bi'ah, the actual act, is an issue, he says. It's not going away. It's there and it's not going away. Not a very nice way to talk about God's mitzvot. I say it's there and it's not going away if a guy has cancer. If a guy has something very bad. If he's got a big problem in his house, a big leak, you come and say, no, it's there, it's not going away. To speak about Hashem's mitzvot, that it's there and it's not going away, doesn't seem so appropriate. He says it is what it is, as if we have to, we have to apologize for Hashem's mitzvot, as if Hashem is taking advantage of us. So, but it is what it is. You know, we, we have to do what God says, no matter what, even though it's not good for us. He says maybe two males who passionately love each other should be able to each other. Just perhaps. Just Drambam will tell you, you're right. It doesn't work for everybody, and it's very sad. But that's the case. So, I admit that I don't know what Rambam 100% means. But I'll tell you for sure what he doesn't mean. The Rambam for sure doesn't mean, as he says it himself, and I don't think he means to say it either, that there are certain mitzvot that certain people are not able to keep. Because that would be considered kefira in free choice. If there's reward and punishment, that means we have choice. We could say yes or no. If we have no choice, how could there be reward or punishment? So for sure, Rambam doesn't mean there are people that don't have the ability to keep a mitzvah. He himself says that. That's for sure not what he means. I also don't think that Rambam means to say that sometimes Hashem takes advantage of an individual. As if to say, Hashem sometimes gives a law that the individual it doesn't fit for him, but there's no choice. The guy's stuck. He got gypped. Hashem put him in a situation where He made him a certain way. He gave him a certain rule that doesn't fit with him. The guy has to keep it. He has choice, he has to, but he has to suffer. It's not good for him. It's not good for him to keep it. But God says, I don't care. Suffering or not, you're going to keep it. That also can't be what the Rambam says. Because the Torah repeats itself many times over. How all the mitzvot, Hashem says, Re'eh anochi noten lefnechem ayom beracha uklala. Hashem says, I'm giving you the opportunity for blessing. It says, Ve'itzavenu Hashem commanded us, La'asot et kol ha'chukim ha'ele. All the mitzvot were commanded. Le'tov lanu kol hayamim. The Torah is good for us. It may be hard. It may be challenging sometimes. But it's good for us. That's a basic elementary understanding of the Torah. The Torah is good for us. Even if it's hard for us. Even if we don't understand it. I'm not judging anybody. And I know that for some people, it's harder to do something than others. Hashem made every person differently. I'm not judging anyone. But bottom line, the mitzvot are tov. They're not just something, oh, they're not going away. We're not going away. They're, they're our prize. They're our gift from God. I mean, not going away. You give your, you give your wife a hundred thousand dollar diamond ring. You say, you know, it's not going away. Letov lach. Hashem says, Re'en atati lepanecha yom. Look, I've given before you today et ha'ayim ve'et ha'tov. I gave you life. I gave you good. Ki liviat hen. Hen le Roshecha, Pasuk says, Shlomo Mena says, he says, the Torah is like a beautiful accompaniment that is on your head, like a beautiful crown that walks with you wherever you go. Va'anakim le Gergerotecha, like a beautiful necklace that's on your neck. The Torah gives us beauty. The Torah makes us better. It makes us accomplished. We can't say that Rambam means that a person has to keep the mitzvah. It's bad for him, but he has no choice. What does the Rambam mean? Some explain that Imam, he means that sometimes from our viewpoint, 
it looks like the mitzvah is not a fit for us. For example, for example, a person who's a Kohen is not allowed to marry a divorcee. Torah says a divorced woman cannot marry a Kohen. What's the reason? Now, Torah didn't give a reason. But on our own, we could say, oh, it makes sense. The Kohen is a priest of Am Yisrael. He's there serving the nation with his sacrifices. He's our teacher. He's teaching everybody. Usually, why does someone divorce his wife? Usually, she's not Tzadik, Ishet Hayel. Usually, like the Pasuk says, Matzah Ba'ir Vaddava. He saw something not good with her. So he got rid of her. Imagine the Kohen now takes the guy's wife. First of all, it's not befitting him. And what would the guy get? What's he going to think when he sees the Kohen? So wow, <laughs> that's the Kohen? He took, he took this woman? I threw her out of my house. He took her? Imagine the chief rabbi took the woman that you couldn't stand because she was driving you nuts because she was so bad. Hashem says, no, Gerusha. Divorced woman is not for you. Let's say you have a situation where it's not the norm. Let's say the woman is an Eshet Hayil. She's the greatest woman in the generation. She's a prophetess. She's the top. Her husband was a little nuts. But she, there's no woman in the world like her. And she's divorced. Comes the Kohen. He wants to marry a woman. This is the perfect woman. She was married for an hour. And she realized who her husband was. I'm, I'm out of here. So the Kohen would say, Oh, well, the Lord doesn't, that doesn't apply to me. This is not a fit with me. Yeah, I understand a regular divorced woman. That's not this case. That's the way he perceives it. Just like a person, like the Rambam says, in nature it's like that. Let's say we pray for rain. We want rain. And finally it rains. And it's raining. Everyone's so happy. But there's one guy who's planning a camping trip for a, for a whole week. He's going camping with his family. He's been planning for a year to go. And that week it's raining all over. He says, ah, oh, Shemai Sal, rain is horrible. Can't believe it. Tell him the rain is good. Says, well, rain is good? Not for me, it's not good. From his eyes, it looks like rain is not good. Let Ma say it's good for him too. He just can't understand why. For the Kohen, even that woman is not good for him. He can't understand why. Shlemut doesn't look to him like it's coming from this situation. That is perhaps what the Rambam meant. But certainly not. And it's certainly, I'm not sure what the connection to this class is. Is he mean to say that a guy who's doing such an act has no free choice? The Torah was not designed for him? Or does he mean to say that God doesn't care about you and He's making you do it anyway, even though it's not good for you? Because really, it's better for you to be with a guy? What, what, what does it mean? It can't be either one of those. I think that's um, a little overview of what was said. I think one has to be very, very careful with the way he listens to things and certainly the way he speaks about things. And our job as Yehudim, as Jews, is to bring Kiddu Shem Shemaim, to sanctify God's name. We sanctify God's name by keeping mitzvot, by doing good to each other, by loving each other, by loving God. By doing the mitzvot, ben adam la havero, ben adam la makom. By looking at the positives in people and seeing the good in people and not accusing people of things. By caring for those who are not doing the right things and try to lift them. By teaching them and by showing them how good the Torah is for them. By bringing them closer to the Torah and having them look at role models that they should look up to and see and try to emulate that all of us could be together, Am Ehad, serving Hashem, doing what's good in God's eyes, and we should find favor. In Sahen, Be'anei Elohim Ve'adam, find favor in the eyes of God and the eyes of men.